The big problems with classic hypothesis testing are well known, and yet a huge majority of statistical analysis are still conducted this way. So why is it? Why are things so hard to change? Can you even do, and should you do, hypothesis testing in the Bayesian framework? Well, I guess if you wanted to name this episode in a very Marvelian way, it would be base factors against the p-values of madness. But we won't do that. It wouldn't be appropriate, would it? Anyways, in this episode, I'll talk about all these very light and consensual topics with Eric Jan Wagenmakers, a professor at the Psychological Methods Unit of the University of Amsterdam. For almost two decades, EJ has staunchly advocated the use of Bayesian inference in psychology. In order to lower the bar for the adoption of Bayesian methods, he is coordinating the development of JASP, an open-source software program that allows practitioners to conduct state-of-the-art Bayesian analysis with their mouse. The one from the computer, of course, not the one from Disney. EJ has also written a children's book on Bayesian inference with the title Bayesian Thinking for Toddlers. Rumor has it that he's also working on a multi-volume series for adults, but shh, that's a secret. EJ's lab publishes regularly on a host of Bayesian topics, so check out his website, particularly when you're interested in Bayesian hypothesis testing. And the same goes for his blog, by the way, Bayesian Spectacles. Wait, wait, what's that? Oh, right. EJ is telling me that he plays chess, squash, and that, most importantly, he enjoys watching arm wrestling videos on YouTube. Yet another proof that, yes, you can find everything on YouTube. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 61, recorded April 25, 2022. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbasestats.com. That's learnbasestats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash learnbasestats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash learnbasestats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo control? science like I'm Richard Feynman. Well, look at that. Today, I have the honor of welcoming Mr. Aubrey Clayton in the LBS family. Does this name ring a bell? Well, of course, Aubrey was my guest for episode 51, and he's, most importantly, the author of the acclaimed Bernoulli's Fallacy book. So, thanks a lot for supporting the show on Patreon, Aubrey. That means a lot to me and that really helps the show a long way. And if you want to join Aubrey and dozens of fellow Bayesians in the LBS Slack channel, well, it's easy. Just go to patreon.com slash learnbasedance. Okay, now let's make some enemies by talking about hypothesis testing with EJ Wagenmakers. Eric Jan Wagenmakers, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Happy to be here. Yeah, me too. I'm very happy that you're there. A lot of listeners ha actually have asked me for an episode with you. And also I'm happy because I had one of your co-authors, Michael Lee, here on a previous episode, which I think was episode 31. And of course, this will be the show notes. And a big thank you to one of my close friends and associates and partner in crimes, Thomas Vicky, who made the introduction with you. So 
Thomas, if you hear us, uh, vielen Dank. EJ, I have a lot of questions for you, so let's dive right in. And as usual, we'll start with your origin story. So, yeah, how did you come to the stats and data world? And was it a serious or a straight path? That's interesting. So I've, my background is in experimental psychology. So that's not directly related to the stats and data world, I guess. But my advisor at the time at the University of Groningen was uh, Ritske de Jong. And he already did some quantitative modeling of response times mm -hmm. in the speeded cognitive tasks. And when I did my PhD, this was with Jeroen Rijmakers. And also one of my advisors at the time was Rich Schifrin. And this is mathematical psychology. Later on, I did a postdoc with uh, Roger Radcliffe in the same field. So mathematical psychology. So this is a field where some people, uh, you know, uh, find it a contradiction in terms, but it's really not. <laughs> Every field has its mathematical subdiscipline. So we, in mathematical psychology, we basically build models and we try to understand human cognition using those models. So mm. m how memory works, how decision-making works, how attention works. So um, sometimes you hear people complain that there is no theory in psychology, but this is because they haven't checked out the Journal of Mathematical Psychology. And when they check out that journal, they will quickly realize that maybe there is too much theory in psychology. I should also mention the new journal, Computational Brain and Behavior, that, uh, that is published by, uh, uh, I think it's published by Springer, but it is uh, affiliated with the uh, Society for Mathematical Psychology. So once you're in mathematical psychology, then the step to the stats and data world is really, really small. Yeah, I guess that. How in the first place did you end up in mathematical psychology, actually? Well, that's an interesting story. So what I did is I, I was an undergraduate student with uh, Ritzke de Jong. And at some point I asked Ritzke, I said, what should I do with my life? Should I maybe become a computer programmer? And he said, no, you're not trained to be a programmer. There's other people who can do this much better. So why don't you just continue in academia? And I thought, okay, I'll apply to a few positions. And one of those positions was with Jeroen Rijmakers. And I remember I did a job interview because in the Netherlands, when you're a PhD student, it's, it's more like a real job, right? So you get a salary and, and there's also a, a job interview. And I remember also uh, Peter Molenaar was part of that committee. And he kept asking me, do you know this? It was a particular mathematical procedure. And I would say, no, I don't know this. And he would ask another question about another procedure. And I, again, I would have to say, no, I don't know this. And this, this kept going on. So I thought, like, this isn't going very well. <laughs> kept going on for four hours and I don't know why I was still in the meeting. Yeah. Uh, remember that when I w traveled back in the train, I felt really kind of depressed because mm. the topic I thought at the time was memory modeling. And I thought, this is so incredibly boring. Should I really dedicate the next four years of my life to this incredibly boring topic? I'm not sure. But my, but my advisor Ritzke from Groningen said, Jeroen Rijmakers is the best psychologist in the Netherlands. And so I thought, well, if he's pretty good, and a lot of people uh, are apparently into memory modeling, maybe it won't be so bad. So I accepted the position. And then, of course, within a week, once you, you know, start to read the literature, you get interested in the topic. And it didn't turn out to be quite as boring as I anticipated. So I was quite happy that I, uh, that I ended up uh, accepting that position. Hmm. Oh, yeah. So like you had, a, you had quite a bad prior. You updated it quite fastly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That was a good posterior then. Cool. So quite random, actually. Like quite a bit of randomness. Yeah. Yeah, but I did think that at the time I already had a a preference for, you know, making theories exact and quantitative. And maybe that's my I'm not sure whether it's my background in chess that mm. did that for me, but I've always been sort of a little allergic to just verbal explanations. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly something I appreciated at the time. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can definitely relate to that. That was the thing that I didn't like in political science, for instance, uh, especially international relations, where it's just like, how do you test? Yeah, how do you test? The yeah, exactly. hypothesis, and like, if you cannot test your ideas, like, is it really scientific? Right. Um, yeah. Or is it just speculation? Which is interesting, but not really in the same realm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I understand. And so, like, what about today? Like, how do you define the work you're doing? and the topics that you are particularly interested in. Right. So I would say I'm still interested in cognitive modeling, mm -hmm. although, of course, the, the models you're interested in, they change over time. I, I did mm -hmm. memory modeling with uh, 
with Jeroen Rijmakers and with uh, Rich Schifrin. But when you're a postdoc with Roger Radcliffe, you do response time modeling. And I still enjoy that. But I've done some work on reinforcement learning models as well. I still do this, but I would say in general, my work is, as uh, Laplace uh, said, common sense expressed in numbers. So it's a bit of philosophy of science. It's also based in inference, of course, and it's open source software for teaching and practicing uh, statistics. And uh, in the future, I might study why smart people believe weird things, to quote Michael Shermer on this. So I'm just so puzzled, and I think everybody is, about the popularity of uh, conspiracy theories, religion, frequent statistics, that sort of thing. Nice. Well, that sounds fascinating. I hope I'll be able to invite you back on the podcast to talk about that once you have some some interesting things to to talk about with us. So, like you you said that basically you are working about all those things which are related to basically the way we think and maybe not why, but how we end up thinking the way we think, mm -hmm. which like I, I think we can put under the umbrella term of cognitive modeling. Mm -hmm. So can you define that field for uh, listeners and why would Bayes be useful in that field? Right. Well, in cognitive modeling, usually what we try to do is we try to come up with one formal model, so not a verbal explanation, but something that makes actually concrete predictions, a, one, a formal model for a particular kind of phenomenon related to cognition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's lots of cognitive activities that we engage in, attention, memory, decision-making, those kinds of things. And I think one of the promises of this style of modeling is that it allows you to capture more than a single phenomenon. There's this wonderful paper, You Can't Ask 20 Questions to Nature and Win, and from the 70s. And in that paper, it's discussed how uh, particular fields tend to focus on these binary yes-no questions. And then after they try to answer that question, the answer is usually we really don't know or it depends, and then they move to the next question. And one of the hopes with these models is that you can instantiate particular principles in these models. And these principles allow you not just to account for one particular phenomenon, but for a range of interrelated phenomena. And I think that's really when you when a model does that well, then you have the feeling that you've really learned something about how that particular part of cognition works. Hmm. So it can tie together, if it's done well, tie together different phenomena. Right? Or sometimes you have a relatively simple model, like I would say Redcliffe's diffusion model that says small bits of information, small bits of evidence are accumulated over time un until a threshold and then a response is initiated. Mm -hmm. And that is a simple idea, right? That you can say that in one sentence, but it accounts for a surprising diversity of benchmark phenomena. I really think that's one of the success stories in the in the field of mathematical psychology. Mm, yeah, so it's like trying to get to the smallest building block of how then we can build more complex models of how people relate to topics and how they think about them. Right, right. Mm. But it's also sometimes with a simple model, mm -hmm. you can actually account for complex behavior. Mm. So the complex behavior is actually maybe the result of, of uh, relatively simple basic principles, such as in uh, the case of the Redcliffe diffusion model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's something I, I was thinking about here yeah, these days. Because so I'm I'm reading quite a lot these days about physics because somehow like the nerd in me decided it was fascinating. Yeah, so like there is, uh, and and I found that interesting point in a book where you can there are a lot of phenomena that you can model at the macro level pretty easily, but you're not able to model the micro level decisions. Right. But yes. at the macro level, it's actually quite easy to model because you're able to model the sum of the behavior, but not the individual behaviors. Yeah, like molecules in a gas or something, uh, fluid yeah. dynamics, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Or you can see that even in, econo in economics, where you've got a pretty good idea of what an economy would do if there is deflation, for instance, but you're not able to predict what any individual will do. Right. Yes. But you can still have a very useful model at the macro level. And that's why some models are useful right. because you don't need to know like the exact small parts to get the aggregate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I've uh, toyed around with uh, 
this golden board, right, where these little marbles, they drop down and they hit a, a pellet and they go either left or right and they hit a different pellet, go left or right, right? And so theoretically, they should just land straight on the next pellet and then neatly go left or right. And then mm-hmm. you get this, uh, when you look at the, the whole population of those pellets, it forms sort of a neat normal distribution approximately. But when you create a video of that process, you see that it's not neat at all, right? It, the little marbles, they bounce off the pellets and they go in all sorts of directions. But still, the behavior of the group is still very regular. It's mm. still that normal distribution, yeah. even though any single unit is, is behaving quite erratically. Yeah, and I think that's so that's so unintuitive, right? Uh, like to at least a lot of people who don't deal with models, because it's something I often have, for instance, when I talk about electoral forecasting models with people, it's like a common like thing people have against models. It's like, yeah, but you cannot model people, therefore you cannot model an election. And it's like, yeah, actually you can. <laughs> it's like, that doesn't mean that you're not original and you don't have your own, you know, free will and don't make your own choices, but just as a species, as an aggregate, we are actually quite predictable. And so you can make those kind of predictions. So, but I find that interesting because it's also, I think it's a kind of protection mechanism, you know, where it's like people saying, you know, but I am original and I'm like, I matter. Yeah. It's true, but. Just like when you put you look at the aggregate, it's easier to model. Whereas it's true that it's extremely complicated to model exactly what one person would, will do. But, but it is a little paradoxical, right? That yeah. you don't know really how a single person works, and then you add more people that you don't know how they work. And but then together, when you combine all that ignorance, yeah. somehow you are now able to to make good predictions. Yeah, it's so it's so counterintuitive, and I love. But that exactly the kind of phenomenon I love. <laughs> okay, that's so awesome. So I'm already drifting off. Uh, so let me let me go back to uh, actually a, a question I ask every guest, which is: Do you remember how you first got introduced to Bayesian methods? And today, is it something that you really frequently use? When you did that podcast with my long-term collaborator Michael Lee, mm-hmm. so Michael indicated that he was introduced to Bayesian methods by uh, Jay Myung and Mark Pitt. And I think the same happened to me. And in particular, they have a 1997 paper on Occam's Razor in Mm -hmm. uh, Psychonomic Bulletin and Review. And I think it's still one of the best introductions to the advantages of the Bayesian approach. Mm. And so why it resonated with me, and I think with a lot of people in the math psych community at the time, is that, that in that field, you're often comparing different models of human behavior that are structurally different. So it's not the case that one is neatly nested, a special case of a more complex one, in which case you could use like p-values or something. Mm-hmm. But but they're just very different models. So it's not easy to point to one as being the null hypothesis. Say. So, so with these non-nested models, now how are you going to compare them? Well, then very quickly you move to, well, maybe we should compare them based on their predictive performance. And then, and then it's only a very, very small step to base. And in, in general the field of mathematical psychology has never really used p-values very much. That field has always been very open to alternative inference procedures. Uh, Not only Bayes, by the way, but also what I view as related methods such as minimum description length. Mm, I see, yeah. And so so it's something from what you say, it's something that actually you started using pretty pretty fast in your your career, or did you have a switch well, at some point. Yeah, well, it was certainly the case that my first papers definitely reported p-values. <laughs> and it was also definitely the case that I didn't really know what I was doing. Or I mean, you could argue, and do you really ever know exactly what you're doing when you do statistics? It's, I'm not sure, but mm. at the time, I definitely didn't know what I was doing and I was just doing what everybody was doing, mm. which is, I think, what most the case for most people. But then after I sort of caught the Bayesian bug, I switched, I think the real switch happened when I was in Roger Radcliffe's lab, when I was a postdoc. And since that time, I don't think I've reported a p-value. Maybe if reviewers insist, I may report it in addition to a Bayesian analysis. But mm, uh, that nice. happens very rare, very rarely, I should say. Mm, so that's good. And that actually anticipates on my, on my next question, which would be, so like you use that very frequently, but how frequently... Bayesian stats used in your field in general? In mathematical psychology, 
I would say Bayesian methods are very common, hmm. maybe even more common than using a straightforward p-value. Hmm. But in experimental psychology, yeah, their, their base is still utterly dominated by the p is smaller than 0.05 approach. Definitely. Mm-hmm. So it's not like in, you know, I don't know, machine learning or even uh, statistics proper, right? Because statistics itself uh, has a, uh, presents a mix of methodologies, but their base is actually quite popular. It's certainly not used in less than, you know, 3% of the papers, which is what I roughly estimate is, is the rate of Bayesianism in experimental psychology at the moment. Hmm. So actually quite, quite interesting because then that means that, yeah, this kind of thinking is pretty, pretty well widespread in the field. Do you have any idea why? <laughs> you mean why in mathematical psychology it's uh, it's relatively widespread? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, well, I think in mathematical psychology, people have always looked on statistical inference in general as something, an activity that's almost a little dirty. You build your models, you have them make predictions, you have strong tests for those theories. And I forgot who said it. Maybe it was Rutherford who said something like, If your experiment needs statistics, you should do a different experiment. And I think something of that nature also holds in mathematical psychology, right? If your model needs statistics, you should develop a different model. For instance, in, I could also just say, uh, like they do in psychophysics, if we, if we measure our participants on the kilo trial levels, thousands of trials, then, you know, your standard errors are so small that you can't see them when you when you plot the mean, right? Mm-hmm. Because the, the dot that represents the mean just eclipses the standard errors. And so in that case, you can just basically look at the data. So there's always been a sort of disdain for p-values because they people felt they didn't, they just simplify something complex into a binary decision that, that's just a little removed from what you're trying to do with your modeling, right? You're trying to understand human cognition, make predictions, test those predictions. But yeah, th- those p-values didn't, didn't really fit the bill, I think. I see, yeah. And so is it also related to maybe the kind of data that you have? Like how big is the data basically in the in your world and the kind of, of models you work with? That does differ a bit. Mm-hmm. In psychophysics, they do have a lot of data per participant, but they often have very few participants, right? So it's common to see like four four participants the author themselves, the wife of the author, and two friends, say. So, uh, but then thousands and thousands and thousands of trials because you really need to be uh, devoted to stick with the experiment. But I don't think that in mathematical psychology it's necessarily the case that there's like so, so much data that, for instance, all your p-values will be statistically significant regardless of what's going on. Mm -hmm. That is more a recent trend, I think, where people started to use uh, real-world data and big data, and then you have that. But that's not traditionally what uh, what is going on in, in mathematical psychology. I would say in mathematical psychology, you usually have a little bit more data than in experimental psychology because you're trying to test your models. So you often need, instead of just two conditions, you maybe want to have five or six because you want to have an entire range of data points for your model. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, there's often more data in mathematical psychology. But I wouldn't uh, point to that as the cause for why p-values are, are used so little in mathematical psychology. I just think maybe the questions that people ask or what they're trying to do is just a little bit more interesting and you can't really put that into a, into a p-value in a meaningful oh. way. Oh, okay, I see. So it's like the model and the generative process that you're trying to model and the story that the model is telling is actually very important. Yeah, exactly. Even more than just knowing whether it's significant or not. Exactly. Ah. If you, for instance, if one model predicts an increase of some of something with a particular factor mm-hmm. and another model predicts a decrease, then, you know, you plot the data and you see whether there's an increase or a decrease. And, you know, at that point, you don't even really need a p-value. Mm. So if it's so in that sense, I can actually agree a little bit with Rutherford, right? If you don't, if you, if it's so, if it's unclear that you actually need to calculate a p-value in order to make your claim, maybe you should just collect a bit more data mm. to make it unambiguous. Okay, awesome. I feel like we've already talked a bit about what I want to want to ask you now, but so I'm going to ask you. So, for like, I mean, in this episode, we're more going to talk about 
stats and, and the methods. Again, I'll refer listeners to episode 31 with Michael Lee for examples of, uh, of applications of Bayes uh, to cognitive science. And so what do you think more generally, because here you said that in mathematical psychology, uh, Bayesian stats are, are quite well used, but that in other fields in psychology, they are still very in the minority. So I'm wondering, what do you think causes researcher to stick to non Bayesian methods in those cases? So yeah, that's interesting. And that's also one of the things that I would like to study, right? When I said before, uh, why mm. do smart people believe weird things? <laughs> there are very smart people who still stick to non-Bayesian methods. And I just, I just look at it and I'm like, why would you do that? Because, you know, you, you have a lot to offer. Why would you waste your mental energy on this? It's very interesting. It's a very interesting question. In an uh, interview with Dennis Lindley, my Bayesian hero, Sir Harold Jeffries, mm -hmm. was asked whether he knew any scientist that actually used Jeffrey's procedures. Mm -hmm. And so I should point out, for a few decades, Harold Jeffries was essentially the world's only Bayesian, or at least the only Bayesian whose main goal was practical data analysis instead of philosophizing. And Jeffries was also a famous geophysicist. And for instance, he discovered through mathematical analysis that the core of the Earth was liquid. So anyway, Jeffries was asked whether he knew any scientist that actually used his own Jeffrey's procedure. So Jeffrey says, no. Right. So imagine you're on the top of your field, you've written books, papers about this particular method, and you don't know anybody who's actually using it. So then the follow-up question, of course, is why? And then Jeffrey's answered with one word, laziness. Hmm. And I think it's, that's essentially correct. Maybe you could also say it's akrasia, so a lack of willpower. Mm -hmm. So maybe researchers suspect that Bayes buys them more, but they're kind of reluctant to invest the time and energy to learn the approach, which actually by itself may be a Bayesian thing to do, right? So you have two actions you could take, learn Bayes or not learn Bayes, and then you have utilities associated with mm -hmm. those actions, yeah. right? And so your utility for not learning Bayes may actually be higher than for learning Bayes. And so then it's the optimal Bayesian solution not to learn Bayes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Lindley offered himself in a different paper, Lindley offered a different hypothesis. So he said students are not taught Bayesian statistics. So if you're not taught Bayesian statistics, then when you become a researcher, you will just practice what you were taught. And when you have to teach, you teach the same method that you have practiced, which is the one you were taught. And so you perpetuate this cycle. So to break through this cycle is, is very difficult. Yeah, for sure. Because I feel like you also have to change the, the incentives. Because like also why aren't researchers interested in like learning new methods? Like, like in the end, the, like, the fact that the method is sound or not doesn't really matter. And what matters is really the result. And so if you have a very result-oriented process more than a process-oriented process, right? Yeah. well, doesn't really matter. Like it, It's the same thing for open source incentives, right? I feel like the research world could be an incredible source of open source contributions and advances, but just like there is no incentive to do real yeah, absolutely. open source. Absolutely. And I'm biased, of course, because I also yeah. develop open source software. But if you, it's kind of, it's really strange that there's really no good grant support for developing open source software in, in, in science, which is yeah. ridiculous, right? So, so the, what we have, we get because people feel like, hey, this is good for the world and I re should really do it, but it's not really rewarded or supported. Yeah. So yeah, that's r really annoying. I hope it will change in the future. Who knows? Yeah, because it's pure altruism and yeah. that's not, not great to only rely on that. <laughs> right. But it's not pure altruism. With all of those things, right, altruism, I mean, you sure. get compliments from people who use it. Yeah. And it makes you feel like you're contributing something to the world. So maybe that's, maybe altruism doesn't exist, right? Yeah. But, but oh, yeah. yeah. So well, it's not, it doesn't directly buy you something. That's clear. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I love that. That reminds me of the, like, there is an episode of Friends where Phoebe tries to convince Joey that pure altruism uh, exists so that gives birth to a lot of interesting experiments <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that episode but oh yeah, yeah it's really good like in one of them like she lets uh, a bee bite her and then 
sting her, no, sting her, uh -huh. and and then Joey says, "But you know, the bee died after after beating you." <laughs> so like, then she's like, "Oh no! Oh my god! What have I done?" That's it. <laughs> Hilarious. So yeah, definitely go go there and and watch that, uh, listeners. Also, I uh, to compensate. Of course, added the uh, the paper you mentioned, so you can't play twenty questions with nature and win. So it's by, by Alan Newell, Newell right? right? Yeah. So I I added that in the show notes. You'll tell me if it's the wrong link, EJ, but I think it's the right one. Yeah, there's very few papers with comparable titles. I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I actually didn't know, but but it, but uh, that looks super interesting. Yeah, I think it actually inspired sort of these uh, very generic frameworks like Act R. You know that are sort huh. of these uh, production system, production rule systems, where they basically try to explain not just one element of cognition, but basically all of cognition. Mm. That was kind of a formal argument against this paper, I would say. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the or not an argument the... against the paper, but a but a but a consequence of the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first sentences of the paper are definitely interesting. I am a man who is half and half. Half of me is half distressed and half confused. Half of me is quite content and clear on where we are going. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I feel I still think it's a really uh, uh, that paper hasn't lost much of its relevance today. I think mm. it would be interesting to see yeah, to what sure. extent it would still apply. Yeah. Actually, so related to that question, so like here we talked about about like yeah, changing incentives and so on. But more generally, how do you think? Do you have some ideas of how we could change that and like reward people for researchers who are not staying in the status quo and not being lazy, right. being able and willing to experiment more with new methods? Yeah, well, that's an important question. And I think, again, it uh, like we discussed, it centers on utilities and incentives. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's a silver bullet solution. But I do think there's a number of components that are really important. So now I'm going to cast this specifically in terms of Bayesian methods, but I think it holds for any new methodology you propose. So I think first it needs to be very clear how Bayesian inference can actually help the researcher, how it can be helpful in concrete, pragmatic scenarios. Because if it's not helpful, you're not buying anything with the methodology and your utility will always tell you stay with the status quo. Yeah, for sure. Now, secondly, the, we desperately need more introductory textbooks on Bayesian inference. So, we've ha of course, if you Google an introduction to Bayesian statistics, you'll find you know, numerous books. But what is meant is really an introduction to Bayesian statistics for professors in mathematics at MIT. Right? That's not the group of people that we need to talk to. Right? We need to talk to first year students in psychology or medicine, because we're talking about cognitive science now, but the fact that people are still using p-values in fields such as medicine, right, where we're talking life and death, right, that's really upsetting to me. Mm. And the third component I would say, and that also relates to utilities, is that Bayesian inference needs to be easy, almost trivially easy to execute in software. Mm. So yeah, my group at UVA has tried to contribute to each of those uh, components. So, hmm. in a way, you know, you're trying to level the playing field because, you know, with with p-values are easy to obtain. Yeah. And so, if you propose something else, but you make it difficult, then that's not starting off right, I would say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So, yeah, the, these two parts, actually, <laughs> that's great because that's where I wanted to take the, the episode. So, yeah, actually, let's talk about that part about the why would that be useful for you like why would base be useful in your like in your research if you're a researcher and like so mm -hmm. to take concrete cases like what because it's you what you need to do is convince them that it's useful so what do you win what do you lose when you switch switch from the latter to the former and here i know that you can talk about the differences between Bayesian estimation and testing so like, can you yeah can you tell us what you have to say here and that how that could help the things that we just yeah. talked about yeah absolutely so when bayesian inference was born uh, basically uh pierre simon laplace first introduced it i mean i mean thomas bayes was first but pierre simon laplace really 
independently invented it and yeah. popularized it. So that approach by Laplace was purely an estimation approach. So you assume a model, you assign a, a continuous prior distribution to a parameter, and you update that distribution to a posterior as the data come in. But Jeffries argued that in some cases, that estimation approach violates common sense and contradicts accepted scientific procedure. So essentially, the estimation approach does not incorporate an Occam's razor. So the idea that you adopt a complex model only when the data provide evidence in its favor. In 1921, around 1919, 1921, 1923, Jeffries and his collaborator, Dorothy Rinch, allow, argued a, a sp for a specific case. So they said, let's consider a general law. So apples grow on apple trees. And if you want to assess that general law, it requires a testing mindset. It, that general law requires a separate prior mass, which is basically prior mass on a point. If you don't do this, then and you just apply, say, Laplace's rule of succession, that Laplace's rule of succession from, from his estimation approach, that implies that if you only observe a sufficiently large number of apples, you can be absolutely certain that at some point you will find an apple that does not grow on an apple tree. And Jeffries thought, and Rinch thought, this was preposterous. So the scientific procedure is we start with the simplest model that accounts for the data, mm -hmm. and we only adopt more complex models when we must. So the way uh, Rinch and Jeffries dealt with this is they said that simple model that needs to have a separate prior probability, and then you need to see whether it is basically outpredicted by a more complex model. So in a sense, what Rinch and Jeffries did is they generalized Laplace's ideas to not just have es estimation, but also testing. And I find it ironic that some Bayesians nowadays, they advocate an estimation-only approach. And they are basically regressing back to the original position of Laplace. But I'm not sure that they're really aware of the work by Rinch and Jeffries and the arguments that Rinch and Jeffries put forward for adding the testing scenario to the estimation scenario. But I, coming back to the practical relevance here for mm -hmm. scientists, so that testing approach that is very congruent with scientific procedure. Stick to the simple model until the data force you to adopt the complex model. Or if you want to make a claim as a scientist, I have found evidence for X, mm -hmm. then, then you need to show that evidence, right? Which is what the testing approach gives you but the estimation approach doesn't. It gives it indirectly when you eyeball the prior and the posterior distribution, but only indirectly. I see. So the what you call the estimation approach here is like only looking at models and not at test statistics. The estimation approach would be looking only at a single model. Right? Ah, okay. So for instance, you could say, um, if extrasensory perception exists, mm -hmm. I predict it to be relatively small. So you assign some continuous prior, very close to, say, uh, chance performance, mm -hmm. and then you see the data and then you update that prior distribution to a posterior distribution, mm -hmm. right? But in that estimation approach, there is no room for a different hypothesis that says extrasensory performance does not exist. And that you have in the testing framework where you say, okay, let's take our null hypothesis that we're just looking at noise, and we're contrasting that to an alternative hypothesis that says something is present. And now we want to see what is the evidence for or against these models. But if your prior is that nothing is present and that it's noise, and then you update your posterior, why is that different? So we have two priors here. There's mm -hmm. the priors on the models themselves, right? So how likely is it that nothing is there? Mm -hmm. And then we have the priors on the parameters within a model. Mm -hmm. So given that it exists, how large do you think it is? Mm -hmm. right. And so what Jeffries argues, argued is he said, first, we need to know whether we're just looking at noise or something real. And then after we're convinced that we're looking at something real, then we can look within the, that model at how large it is. Right. So we first have the testing approach to tell us whether we're looking at noise or whether there's something real. And then after we know that it's real, we look at how large it is. That was Jeffrey's idea. I think the if you try to advocate a testing, an estimation-only approach, I predict difficulties in the 
not only in the review process, but also difficulties writing up your argument. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people use this estimation-only approach. It's also popular now or more popular than it was before within frequentist statistics, right? The new statistics, they call it. Mm. Right? I've seen these papers where people, people are then allowed to give a confidence interval, but they're not allowed to say whether it overlaps with zero. Because once you say it overlaps with zero, now you're testing and they don't want to test. So then you, but it's of course what you want to say as a researcher. You want to say like, look, it's real, right? But you're not allowed to say that. And so you have these very convoluted papers that basically try to beat around the bush. I think ultimately for most endeavors, we really can't do it without our test. Mm. You know, if you have a vaccine uh, efficacy or, mm -hmm. you know, did we find the Higgs boson or, you know, wh whatever you, like very quickly, it boils, boils down to a test. Not everything. I think it's unwise to completely ignore. I think they both have a place, both estimation and testing. And sometimes I'm in the situation where I can only do testing and I really enjoy that because I don't have to be so precise about my prior distributions. I'm not assessing predictive performance. I'm just updating my prior distribution. So when I want to know something about inter-rater reliability, right, then the, the, the hypothesis that inter-rater reliability is zero is of absolutely no interest. So I'm not in a testing situation. I just want to measure how large is inter-rater reliability. Mm -hmm. That's relatively easy. And I think also, because it's so easy, it's very popular. As soon as you start to do testing, now the priors matter, right? Because testing is done by comparing predictive performance for competing models. But where does, do the predictions come from? Well, partly from the prior. So yes, the prior matters because that's where your predictions come from. But it also means that if you have different priors, you have different predictions and a different end result. Mm -hmm. And that makes people very uncomfortable. So I understand that it makes them uncomfortable, but ultimately, you know, this is... Uh, we have that Danish proverb, right? Uh, predictions are difficult, especially when it's about the future. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality we have to deal with. Yeah, yeah. I know for sure. I completely, like, completely agree on that. I'm trying to understand the, um, the practical differences between the two approaches. Because, like, for instance, so what you're saying is that if I have, for instance, on vaccine mm -hmm. efficiency, we have a model, let's say in the model, we have a parameter which estimates the efficiency. Mm -hmm. So... My prior here could be an inform, well, weakly mm. informative. So like, it could be somewhat negative. It could be positive. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's asymmetrical. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we mm -hmm. expect more positive mm -hmm. effects than mm -hmm. negative, but mm -hmm. it overlaps zero. Mm -hmm. And so are you saying that when I run that model and then I update, I get an updated prior on that efficiency. Yeah. This is not sufficient to say whether there is an effect or not and exactly. what the magnitude of this effect and the direction is. Well, you want to include, so, so I would agree it's, it's, that's not sufficient because mm -hmm. for many situations, we want to put in, we want to take into account the null hypothesis that the vaccine that you test simply is not active. It simply doesn't latch on to the biological process at all. And in fact, we have seen in this whole epidemic several sort of cures that turned out to be bogus, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it wasn't that the case that they helped a little bit. It was just that they didn't really attack the relevant biological process at all. Right? Yeah. So there was absolutely nothing going on. <clears throat> now, okay, you can, have a, you can have a conversation. Is it nothing or is it minuscule? But And you cannot measure it. I'm happy to use nothing as a mathematically convenient approximation yeah, yeah. to minuscule. Okay, so I think I understand. So what you're saying is that with the model I was talking about, you would be able to say whether there is an effect, if it's negative or positive, and what is the uncertainty on that magnitude. But you cannot really say that the effect is completely null or exactly. Exactly. really close to null. Exactly. So you can't also a question like, now we have data, to what extent do we have evidence that the vaccine doesn't work? Mm -hmm. right? So evidence in favor of the null. It's very difficult to get that when you, when you don't have a null. I see. When you use the estimation approach, you're basically saying, this, I am absolutely certain that this vaccine has an effect. It may be positive, it may yeah. be negative, it may yeah. be large, it may be small, but mm. it absolutely has an effect, yeah. right? Because the density is in a continuous prior. But if the post zero overlaps zero, actually there is the case where there is no effect at all, but you cannot really say that because you can still say, oh, maybe there is an effect, but we don't know. Right. Well, if it overlaps with zero, you could still say, well, 
we still, if it overlaps with zero, considerably overlaps with zero, you would still say, well, we still are unsure whether it's positive or negative. Yeah. That's what you would say. But you could not speak yeah. to the relevance of the of, of zero itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand. How can you do that? Like, what would you do here? Well, you, you include the hypothesis that the vaccine is completely ineffective and you give that hypothesis, that separate hypothesis, you consider it separately and you give it prior mass. So effectively, you could also view it as a mixture prior mm -hmm. where you have a, a slab, a continuous slab and a spike at zero. That's nice. another way of looking at it, right? So it's like you have to add a parameter to the model where you actually model the case where it's zero. Yeah. That's how you could view it. Absolutely. I see. Yeah. That's one way you could do it. And then it seems like a more complex approach than estimation. I mean, the way Jeffries would see it, mathematically, it boils down to the same thing. But the way Jeffries would see it is we basically start with the model with the spike. Mm -hmm. It says nothing is there. Mm -hmm. And now you make a claim that no, there is something going on. And you represent that by a slab, by a continuous prior distribution. And now we're going to see which model predicts best. And if the null predicts best, there's no reason for us to consider this vaccine as a useful treatment. So you, you could have two different models, or you don't have to have everything in the same model then. Like you could uh, have yes. a model yes, where yes. you only test the null and see the posterior predictions it, may, it makes, and then a model where you are in the case where, okay, we think there is an effect, but we don't know if it's positive or negative, and then see the posterior predictions then, and then compare those models. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. I see. Super interesting. Yeah. So, but, but basically in the estimation approach, what you can do is estimate, is it positive or negative? Mm -hmm. And you could see that as a testing yeah, activity yeah. as well. But this, not everybody agrees on this, but, but in Jeffrey's philosophy, something becomes a testing problem when you assign separate prior mass to a, to a specific point of interest, like zero. So then when you have a spike in an otherwise, on an otherwise continuous parameter, that would in Jeffrey's a uh, viewpoint be a uh, testing scenario. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I was like curious about, okay, I understand. How do you implement that in practice? So I think I right. have an idea. Yeah. So this is also what makes it a little bit more involved or more difficult than the simple Laplacian estimation, because then you put, you have to put a prior in the Laplacian estimation. You have to put a prior on the parameter, but okay, well, after you've done that, the rest is just automatic. And it doesn't really matter what prior you put on, usually, because very quickly the data overwhelm it and you get virtually the same posterior distribution. But this is not the case for the testing scenario because of Occam's razor, right? So if you say, for instance, I have a particular process, let's say the probability with which you solve particular problems correctly, and you put a uniform prior distribution on it from zero to one, right? And I have more knowledge. So like I said, it's, this is a bit more involved. The testing scenario is a bit more involved than the estimation scenario. In the estimation scenario, you have to assign a prior distribution to a continuous parameter. Yeah. And after you do that, you update and you're, and, and that, and you're ready. And it also doesn't matter exactly what you do because the data quickly overwhelm the, the posterior. But in the, Uh, sorry, the data quickly overwhelmed the prior. But in the testing scenario, the prior does matter because it captures your predictions. And that means that Occam's razor comes into play here. So if you have a very broad distribution and somebody else has more knowledge and has a very narrow distribution, mm -hmm. then if the data are consistent with the narrow distribution, then that model made better predictions than the model that was very vague. If you are say, betting on the next team to win the World Cup or something, mm -hmm. and you're betting an equal amount on all the participating teams, then that is not a very good bet. And if you bet more money on the better teams like yeah. and a more, a more a tighter distribution, if one of those teams that you bet a lot of money on wins, you get much more of a return. Right? So the prior really matters for testing. So it requires more attention, Now you could do subjective things uh, ba or base it on prior literature or there's also general rules so that the procedure has relatively good performance but it is a bit more uh, it is a bit more involved and it's that extra effort and also maybe the the perceived fragility 
of the process that people don't like. Mm. Right? I do think it's overstated because, yes, your prior matters. So you can show that if you use a ridiculous prior, yeah. you get ridiculous base factors. But yeah. in my own experience, when I do real data analysis, I actually find that it's quite robust. Mm. Yeah, And sometimes it's not robust in the sense that one base factor gives you 10 million and the other one gives you 100,000. And then you could say, well, it's not robust, but really, you know, the evidence is overwhelmingly strong in either case. So I would argue that that's actually an example of it being robust. So you have to work really, really hard to come up with believable priors that give you meaningfully different results. So yeah. I usually don't manage to do that. But this is somewhat of a ghost, a boogeyman yeah. that is, uh, you know, introduced whenever people think like, oh, maybe I should use a base factor. And people come like, oh, but what about the prior? Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. And, and also same. in jazz, we try to make this really easy, right? Where we have good default settings and with a few clicks, you can obtain base factors and also mm -hmm. see the prior and posterior distribution to get an idea of, uh, of what it means. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about jazz in a minute. But yeah, you anticipated on my next question, which is like, okay, so what we talked about here was how do you do like, how do you add so this case of like the null hypothesis in your model? So you could add that in the same model as in the same pass, or you could have two models that then you compare the posterior predictions from, and also you could compare, I guess, leave one out cross validations and things like that and model comparison algorithms, then you, you enter the, let's say, more classical Bayesian framework. And that, that's cool because then once you have that, you can get your all automated Bayesian workflow. How is that related though to base factors that you just mentioned? Right. And because, so yeah, and also it's a topic I haven't covered, or covered a, a lot on the show. So, can you tell us what they are, how related they are to what you just talked, and right. also at the end, how related they are to P, to classic frequency P? Right, right, right. Right. Well, first, comparison to cross-validation and these uh, posterior predictive p-values and, and such. So the appeal of these alternative methods is also exactly, it's both, kind of both their strength and their weakness, because these alternative methods are usually not so sensitive to the prior distribution. So a lot of people think this is great, but you're lo also losing something. You're losing Occam's razor when you don't bring the prior into play. Because the prior distribution, the width of the prior distribution is one component of how narrow the predictions will be. And the more narrow the predictions, the, the more parsimonious the model. So if you ignore the prior, the price you pay is you move away from a an implementation of Occam's razor. So you can do something approximate. Of course, cross-validation is trying to do something, trying to respect Occam's razor in a way. And it's interesting, there's a paper by uh, Gneiting, I'm not sure whether I, I think I pronounced it, Gneiting, I mm -hmm. would say, and Reftree. And they show that the base vector is a special case of cross-validation. But it's not your usual cross-validation, where you always leave out, say, 20% you leave out varying amounts. So that also means that sometimes you leave out everything or almost everything. And that's when your priors become really important. So there is a, a ver uh, you can do cross-validation and obtain base factors, but it's a particular kind of cross-validation. So it does show you that there is a predictive interpretation to base factors, a cross-validation interpretation, but you have to do cross-validation in a particular way. And then with respect to p-values, I think the biggest difference is that with a p-value, you're looking at, now roughly speaking, right? You're looking at how surprising are these data mm -hmm. under the null hypothesis. In the Bayesian framework, you're, you're comparing how surprising are the data under the null hypothesis to how surprising are they under an alternative hypothesis, mm -hmm. which you then have to specify because we're talking about predictions here. Right? So yeah. you need to specify that alternative hypothesis so that it makes predictions. So it's inherently the base factor is a relative measure. And I would argue this is inherently what evidence means. It's evidence is inherently a relative concept. I think that's the basic. There's other differences as well. But I think that the absolute versus relative measure is the biggest one. Right? So that also explains why if you have a p-value a that is just significant, that it doesn't actually mean very much for a base factor, for evidence. Because the data can be very or relatively surprising under the null, but if they're also surprising under the alternative, 
then there isn't a lot of evidence. Right? So basically, the base sector looks at two sides of the coin. I see. Okay. So that's how it differs from the classic frequency p values. And I think you argue that it's more complete and appropriate in most of the cases. And how would you, so how does the interpretation work of the base factor? Right. Well, there's different interpretations, right? So the first interpretation of a, a base factor would be that it's the extent to which one hypothesis outpredicted the other. So this also means, of course, that you can have evidence for the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis can outpredict the alternative hypothesis because it's more parsimonious, right? It's the same as what we mentioned with uh, putting more money on teams that are likely to win instead of spreading your resources out across a wide range of options, right? There's a penalty associated with spreading out your resources too much. So this is why the null hypothesis can actually uh, win and, uh, and gain support. So there's that interpretation. The other interpretation from Bayes' rule is that the base factor is the extent to which you should update your prior beliefs. So if your prior beliefs are 50-50, on the null versus the alternative, then the base factor comes in and you multiply your prior odds with the base factor and that gives you your posterior odds. Mm -hmm. So this also means that the, right, we have the saying extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And that's directly instantiated in that equation. If you have a very implausible hypothesis, it needs a very strong base factor in order to overcome the prior skepticism. So it's also Bayesian updating, but on the level of hypotheses instead of parameters. I see. Okay. Okay. And then there is the third avenue that I talked about, which is like model comparisons and stuff like that. And you also explained how you could include base factor in that, in that framework. Okay. Uh, do you have actually a link to the paper you mentioned that um, allows to do that? Base factor and model comparison? Well. So I think one of the best papers still is the Mung and Pitt one from 1997 mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Psychonomic uh, Bulletin and Review. Sure. I can send you the link uh, uh, later. Yeah, just add that to the Google Doc of the, of the show notes yeah. and, and yeah. good. Like well, in any case, you can always add things to the Google Doc of the show notes until the, the episode is, um, is right. out. So. Right. I think that's a good one. And uh, I would say that there's also this uh, special issue on Bayesian inference in Psychonomic Bulletin and Review again in 2018, mm -hmm. which was, I think it was edited by Joachim van der Kerkhove, Jeff Rauder, and John Kroschke. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a wonderful a special issue with tons of uh, papers. And also um, Joachim's student, uh, Alexander Etz, has, a, I think, a really a good talent for explaining Bayes clearly. Uh, I'm not sure whether he's been on the show, but if he hasn't, then it's definitely worth uh, inviting him, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Well, if you can make introductions, that's I will. the best. Yeah, thank you very much. That's always the, the best. And definitely that sounds super interesting. I always love people who can explain things very clearly. And because that way I don't have to be smart, which in a way is smart, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. So... Time is running out, so I want to I wanna ask you about the other part of your answer from before, which is basically we need to lower, decrease the hurdles for people to take a base, and we need to decrease the hurdles in that Bayesian workflow. And I'm guessing that's what you're trying to do also with JASP. Very broad question, but what do you think are the biggest hurdles right now in the Bayesian workflow? especially in your field, of course, and how are you trying to improve that with the open software, open source software that you are working on, which is uh, JASP? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because I think the hurdles in the Bayesian workflow, that is actually an area that has seen maybe the most progress over the past decades. Yeah. So originally, of course, we had Winbugs and now Jags and Stan. So with those, with those tools, it's, it's relatively straightforward to formulate and fit a wide range of Bayesian models. So oh, I think from that perspective, there's a huge steps been, have been made. Now, it's still challenging to compute base factors. And my former student, uh, Quinton Gronau, and others have worked on bridge sampling as a convenient method and actually linked it to, to Stan, such that you can take a Stan object and then execute this code and, and get an estimate of the marginal likelihood and the base factor. And I think that actually works pretty well 
it's only a computational solution, of course. So if you have a, a very poor prior distribution, you will still get a, a result that, that is either fragile or not representative or however you want to call that. So it's still a challenge to formulate good prior distributions for hypothesis testing. But overall, I'm actually really positive about uh, Bayesian workflow, right? So I, I'm saying that once you're a Bayesian, life now looks much better and much more pleasant than 40 years ago. <laughs> for sure. The problem is getting people to become Bayesians. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So how do we do that? Do you have the secret formula? Well, definitely not. And I think this is something that really puzzles me, right? Why do people believe weird things? Why do people not become Bayesian. And again, the only thing I can come up with right now is kind of educational indoctrination or the utility argument. Or maybe they also perceive it to be just very difficult and beyond their abilities. Or So again, I, th that comes back to just, uh, it's great to apply Bayes and show all these great results. But ultimately, we as Bayesians, in Bayesians United, we need to move it into the curriculum at a very, very early level. Ideally, either on par with classical methods or maybe in the future even supplanting it. Because it's quite clear, when you supplant it, when instead of teaching frequentist statistics, you would teach Bayesian statistics, within 10 years, the entire field would be Bayesian, right? The entire field of experimental psychology because it's what's being taught, it's what you're supposed to do. And would we be worse off? Would we be better off? Well, I'm actually not that sure. I think we would be better off on a sort of moral, from a kind of a moral perspective, because at least we're doing something that makes sense. But obviously, we wouldn't have changed the incentives in academia itself or the flaws that people have when they do research, such as uh, hindsight bias, cherry picking, those kinds of things. It's, of course, in statistics, it remains true garbage in, garbage out. So if you have unrepresentative data, you will draw an unrepresentative conclusion, no matter how rational or coherent your inference methodology may be. Concretely, how, how do you think you're trying to help that with uh, JASP? So basically, yeah, like maybe yeah. tell people what JASP is about, why right. they would use that and when. Right. And so, yeah, like the maybe the future developments that you have in mind. When we started to develop it, this was about 10 years ago, the original idea was... Uh, Bayesian SPSS, mm -hmm. and then it was generalized to, I guess, what SPSS would have looked like if it had been done right. And this is, I, I don't actually want to say too many bad things about SPSS because, because the idea that you have a graphical user interface is for many students a relief. I program in R, but whenever I have an analysis in JASP, I go to JASP because I can do it like a hundred times faster. I don't have to look for my code. I don't have to look for how do I create a nice plot because everything is there already. And if you have a, something like a t-test and you do it over and over again, right? this just calls for making the procedure automatic, which is what JASP essentially does. All right, So it's mm. a graphical user interface on top of R for statistical analyses. And it offers classical analyses, but also machine learning, a range of other things. We even have auditing. We have worked with a company who switched to JASP. So we have quality control tools in there. But also, of course, a lot of Bayesian statistics. So the user can basically... So we introduced the classical statistics really only as a Trojan horse, right? So that when people executed classical t-test, they will actually see that underneath there, it says Bayesian t-test. <laughs> and then they think hmm, what would happen if I would press this button? And before you know it, they will be on a path towards Bayesianism. But essentially, oh, and I should also mention what we're also trying to do with Jasper, we're trying to make it easier to teach Bayesian statistics. So we have, for instance, a module that is called Learn Bayes. Mm -hmm. And with Learn Bayes, you can teach students Bayesian statistics. And I use it myself in my workshops. And uh, so it was also kind of made to facilitate this. And that works, uh, for me, that works really well. So that's basically what it is. And it, I think it's tremendously powerful. You can also use it to reanalyze published classical results. So um, in a Bayesian way, I would encourage everybody to give it a shot. Yeah, I love especially if they don't know about the Bayesian stuff. Yeah. That's, I love that Trojan horse yeah. strategy. Okay, EJ, like you've been already very generous with your time. So I'm going to ask you one last question before the last two questions. 
this is my sneaky way of not ending the podcast. So yeah, like because uh, we've talked a bit about that already, uh, model averaging, and so you've I know you've been working on on Bayesian model averaging for meta analysis lately. So make it, tell us a bit about that because that's something also that will be new, I guess, for most listeners. Yeah, the idea is quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. In meta analysis, you usually have different models you can entertain. For instance, there can be an overall effect or there cannot be an overall effect. There can be heterogeneity or maybe there is no heterogeneity. And then there can also be publication bias and there's many models for publication bias. So how do we draw our inference when we don't really know the data generating process? Yeah. So one method is to do a two-step process where you first look at the data, you then select one of the models And then you base all your inference on that single model. But if you do that, you kind of ignore the uncertainty inherent in the first step. Mm -hmm. right? So that will only work well if there's one clear winner and everything else is ruled out, basically. Mm -hmm. We rarely have that luxurious situation. So then what do we do if we have all these models into play? Well, the Bayesian answer is you average across them. Right? So then you can say things like, well, there may be publication bias the effect may or may not be present. But what do we know about heterogeneity? Taking all those possibilities into account at the same time. Right? So it basically means that models that predicted the data well have a relatively large impact on your inference, and models that predict poorly have a small impact. So this also means that your method is more robust because it doesn't depend on any single model. And if that single model is wrong, right, then you're drawing a can draw a completely incorrect conclusion. But in the model averaging approach, you kind of mitigate that risk by keeping all models in play. And so this started out, this has work again with Quinten uh, Gronau, but since then, uh, Frantichek Bartos and Maximilian Meyer have extended it to account for publication bias as well. So now our complete ensemble of models is something like 36 models. And we have shown by applications to real data and simulation studies that it actually accounts, that it, its performance across a range of conditions is actually uh, good and better than the individual models that are included in it, right? Because the individual models do well, but only when they are the data generating process. And if they're not the data generating process, they start to make many mistakes. And if you include all models and apply them simultaneously, you don't have that problem. Yeah, I mean, that's the, one of the coolest things I, I discovered when I started learning Bayesian statistics. Then, so like you're basically doing a model is kind of integrating all the uncertainty around the whole process. Yeah. But then you can go one step further and integrate the uncertainty of all the models. Yeah. And it's like, you know, kind of an inception stuff when you're like, poof, yeah. new level. Yeah. Well, like you've got several models. Well, let's average them and integrate over the uncertainty over the choice of models. Yeah. This is incredible. Yeah. There's an early paper that I had together with uh, Jeff Iverson and Michael Lee on the, there was a comment, I think, on the infamous PREP mm -hmm. statistic. And we applied it there as well. But it uh, then it took a long time for me to get back to the idea. Mm. But I do think that, in, in general, that's so nice, right? Anytime you're confronted as a Bayesian with a situation, which model should we choose, right? The standard answer of a Bayesian should be, why choose, right? If there's uncertainty about them, we can just average across these models. So you don't have... And in general, I think that's the difference between a Bayesian and a frequentist. A frequentist wants to maximize just picks the best one, and a Bayesian averages. But of course, we all have a frequentist, almost all of us have a frequentist education. So there's some, this is also a point that Jeff Rauder makes occasionally, we all have these frequentist sort of, these residues from a frequentist education. So it may, we may still be tempted to like pick the maximum or something instead of averaging. But I think averaging is, is what a Bayesian would ideally do. Yeah, I understand. My main question here would be, how do you come up with 36 different models in the first place? That's really easy, right? Because at every point in this tree, the tree divides and you get uh, two to the power of n or something, right? So very quickly, you get to a multitude of models. And I think we could probably do much more. But at some point, of course, the pro procedure also becomes computationally yeah, yeah. Uh, intensive. So we yeah, need yeah. to sort of strike a balance uh, there. Yeah, actually, that depends on what you call a different model, I guess. Because like if, if you just has to change some priors to call it a different model, then yeah, you 
easily get to at least 36 models in your workflow, for sure. It doesn't have to be like a completely different model with different likelihoods, right. different... Well, you know, if you have... So you basically have different factors, right? So if you just have effect present absent, heterogeneity, yes or no, yeah. publication bias, yes or no, then yeah. you already have eight, yeah. right? So you only need a few more of the, these these factors and, and you're quickly up to 36. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Okay, so, like, uh, make sure to to add that uh, paper to the show notes also, because I think it will be uh, very interesting for for listeners. Because we've been very fast on that last question, I should actually probably do an episode where I dive a bit more into model averaging. I also actually think that the one of the other advantages here of a Bayesian approach to model uh, to to um, a meta analysis is that you can keep adding new studies as they come in. Which is so you can just learn as the data come in. Whereas mm. in a frequentist framework, it's always an uncomfortable feeling when you're done with your analysis, you've made your decision, and now a new study comes in, mm. completely unannounced because you didn't have control over the sampling plan, right? So, boom, here's this other study. What do you do? Yeah. Basically, people just just ignore the, the sequential nature of the enterprise, but it is sequential. So, yeah. and this is not something that bothers uh, should bother a Bayesian. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, that's definitely more natural. Awesome. Well, EJ, I'm gonna gonna set you free now. You've been prisoner for for too long, but of course, you know, to get on that freedom, I'm gonna ask you the last two questions I ask uh, every guest at the end of the show. So, first one: If you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? From basically consistent with our uh, conversation, I would say that the problem that I would try to solve is the problem that students are taught a parody of inference and that they perpetuate that parody in their own teaching. And uh, how to do that is, uh, well, well, this is, uh, this is difficult, but I think we have, uh, I think it's about the utilities. So, and utilities and incentives, that's something that need to change because if you, it's clear for everybody who's a Bayesian what the advantages are, right? It's just to make people who aren't yet Bayesians to convince them. And I I think it has to start from the ground up, right? At the very early, uh, levels of teaching. Hmm. So that's definitely something that I would like to change. And it's actually also something why my interests have sh- are shifting now a little bit towards uh, towards education, mm-hmm. because I think it's so, so important. Yeah. No, yeah, for sure. I completely agree with that. And that's actually, so I was the guest in my own podcast on episode 57. <laughs> I think my answer to that question was uh, along education also, yeah. mainly around yeah critical thinking and how do you make smart people not believe them things basically. Yeah. And that's something that really fascinates me. So second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? And keep in mind that answering me is a perfectly valid answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nobody picked me yet. I'm like, I'm like... Yeah, but I think, you know, if you pick somebody who's, who's alive today, you're wasting an opportunity. <laughs> So you're already finding excuses. So it has to be somebody who's <laughs> deceased. And then then the two obvious candidates are Laplace or Jeffries. Mm-hmm. But they both have really deep problems because I would think that anybody who has a dinner with Laplace will quickly feel incredibly stupid. Yeah. And unless you talk to him about like all the modern stuff that he doesn't yeah, know about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the problem is, as a physicist and as an astronomer, he would immediately want to know a lot more about physics and astronomy. Sure. And then I would have to tell him, oh, I don't know this, I don't know this other thing, right? And he would like, how can you not know? You know, and, and uh, like uh, <laughs> I would have to tell him, like, yeah, it's it's really terrible that I don't know these these physics things that are about you know our reality so so important and and I don't know all this stuff and so he will he would feel frustrated. What kind of idiot does he have dinner with? Couldn't I, I mean he's back on Earth for one day? Couldn't they have given him a physicist to have dinner with or something? Well, it's your choice. You know, it's not his. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think he would find it difficult to contain his frustration. So maybe that wouldn't make for a good dinner. Although he would be pleased, I think, to see that that Bayesian inference is yeah. still uh, you know doing so well today. Yeah, yeah, probably. And I think you can, like, he doesn't know what an AirPod is and what oh, an iPhone is. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. So of course. you can, yes, like, yes. have one in your ear, have a physicist friend live, like, he can answer the question yeah. for you and you just, like, parrot. Or, of course, we could just Google it. Right? <laughs> if I'm course. allowed to have my yeah. cell phone. Yeah, that would okay. take more time. And then though. with the cell phone, but then Laplace would probably just take the cell phone yeah, exactly. and spend the entire <laughs> dinner just yeah, Googling. It, yeah, it's too yeah. obvious and it would take too much time. Like it would be like, yeah. So yeah. very good question, Pierre Simon. Just give me five minutes. I'm 
I have to check some. <laughs> there, there. Okay, so perfect. I think we have the perfect strategy to have dinner with Laplace without looking like fools. Awesome. I think so. The other one is Harold Jeffries, but the problem there is that Jeffries was known for basically not speaking very much. Oh. So the dinner would be very awkward. <laughs> so, and I think that problem is not easily solved with, an, uh, no. uh, with a cell phone. So, so <laughs> maybe that sells it and I should just go with Laplace. Yeah. I'll go with Laplace. Yeah, go with Laplace. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, EJ, thanks a lot. It was a real pleasure to have you on the show. We, I'm really glad because we covered a lot of, of topics that we didn't cover a lot yet on the, on the podcast. So, uh, more diversity. We explored more of the typical set of the Bayesian world. So I'm very pleased. I personally learned a lot. I hope it was the same for listeners. As usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. And there will be the, the different papers uh, we mentioned. So thank you again, EJ, for taking the time and being on this show. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Well, yeah, come back anytime once you have cracked how to solve uh, conspiracy theories. Okay. Great. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation. Yeah.